It's the day after the Dutch Grand Prix and it is an absolute pleasure to have you along with us as ever to talk all things Assin with Keith Ewan, Pete McLaren and myself, Harry Benjamin. The summer five week break has officially begun and we've been delivered a bombshell straight away. So naturally, that's what we're going to talk about first. After topping nearly pretty much all the sessions, bar the most important one where Fabio Cortuaro did take the win in Sunday's race, it's his teammate, Maverick Vinales, making all of their headlines second in the race. But it has just been announced that he is requested to end his Yamaha contract early. And by mutual consent, they are going to part ways at the end of the season. Keith, this is massive. What does this mean? Is it confirmation he's going to Aprilia? Who's replacing him? So many questions. There really are. And there are not that many answers when it comes to why he would have done what he did. If you remember, let's wind back to the Suzuki situation. He felt really at home at Suzuki. It was like a family for him and he felt very comfortable there. And it was a real big wrench to make the correct decision to go to Yamaha. I say correct because it was correct. Yamaha was and still is one of the best bikes. I'm nearly choking myself on this because I, I can't believe it myself. I can't, yeah, it's, a, it's a WTF moment, isn't it, really? It's yeah. kind of like, huh? I can't believe what I've, what I've just, and, you know, lots of rumours, lots of talk about it and the like. But how did it actually get to that? Obviously, internally, there's a problem with, with the Yamaha management and Vinales. He doesn't feel like he's getting anywhere. To put it in some kind of context, Valentino Rossi is suffering from a similar problem on the bike. The grip levels that he's getting from, from the acceleration grip levels that they're getting is not really suiting their riding style. You know, Quattararo is riding around it. Some would say, well, they get paid the big bucks, so they've got to be able to ride around these problems when they come. And Quattararo is obviously doing that. The way he sets his bike up looks different to most other people anyway as well. So he's getting around it. But the, but the retirement, the, 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 the throw the towel in situation with Yamaha, We've seen it before, but never quite as dramatic as this one, I don't think. I think this one is, is where is he going to go? Aprilia, do they have a great um, record for pastoral care? Absolutely not. Look at Scott Reddy, look at Bradley Smith. What they, they basically dumped on both of them at the same time. They're a team that's quite harsh on anybody that's not actually performing 100% or in the way that they want them to perform. So I think it's a very risky move to dump the millions of dollars he'd have been on at Yamaha and on the best bike on the, on the track to go to Aprilia, which is not yet, yeah, it's not a top five finisher yet, is it? I mean, at the end of the day, even with Alicia Spargo biting the screen, it's still nowhere near there. And Dovi, you know, I have the, the feeling that Dovi probably would have raced it this year had it been a bit closer than what it is. Um, and yet that deal has not been done. <laughs> well, I suppose we're feeling a bit sorry for, for Maverick Vinales, but uh, <laughs> spare a thought for Dovi because he's just dropped down the pecking order. His stock value has just fallen through the floor, hasn't it? Now that um, you've got Vinales, who's current and younger, available to sign for free virtually. I, I can't make out, Harry or Peter, why you would leave Yamaha other than in the terms of a proper divorce, irreconcilable differences, it has to be done in that circumstance. I don't think there's a winner. I don't think in this at all. I think that neither party would have wanted to have done it. Um, it's obviously something that they've released him from his contract, um, as they would. Um, it said in the British press release that he'd asked to be released. It didn't say that in the Japanese press release, um, we noted this morning from uh, one of our colleagues in Japan. It, that, that part of it was left out. Whether that's for face in Japan, I don't know. But... Mm. Um, that's a point actually worth mentioning, isn't it, Peter? How much the, the Japanese, as a race, hate criticism publicly. It's, it's don't wash your laundry in public in Japan. That's a fact. The teams hate a situation like we had a couple of weeks ago when Maverick was giving them a fairly hard time publicly over the bike. Um, that will not have gone down well. Exactly, Keith. Yeah, and, and let's not forget, only, what, 18 months ago, when, when the contract picks, if you like, were being made for the 2021 season, Maverick was the first one to sign. You know, at the time when he signed, which was January 2020, all of the top seats were available and Yamaha made him their priority, which was a big boost of confidence. Um, you know, for Maverick, it was a big vote in, you know, you are going to be our future guy. And yet here we are and Maverick's saying, I, I, I want to leave. As Keith said, that's a, that's a, it's a big blow for, a, for any team to have that. 
to sever a contract and a very well paid contract again January 2020 that's before the coronavirus so he was one of the few that that signed on on the old terms if you like so can you imagine what can, can you imagine what's going on in the paddock at the moment the, the, it's the best exercise rider management have ever had this year because they'll be running down that paddock backwards and forwards face masks on trying to trying to get in there and get this deal done because you've got all sorts of things going on now it's losing it yeah with the possibility and i think a very distinct possibility that valentino rossi will call it a day in the next few weeks as well so you've got two factory yamaha men from last year that aren't even going to be on the bloody calendar maybe for next year at the moment um and all of a sudden morbidelli he should definitely be shifted up into a factory bike whatever happens franco morbidelli when he comes back from that knee injury quite rightly actually his timing is quite good because he's kept himself out of this bun fight hasn't he he's getting that that knee that's been playing him up a little bit over the last few months he's getting that knee fixed um and by the time he comes back at the end of this um long layoff the longest layoff we've had in in ages for the summer break he should be on top form by the time he comes back maybe half a year on a factory bike i wonder if they can actually move maverick across to patronus to the srt team and put him on a on a, a two-year-old bike i wonder what's in his i wonder what's in his contract he wouldn't surely agree to it so it'd have to be in his contract that they can place him in any team they want to place him in yeah uh, I, I, I think he yeah i think he, you have to use the same it, the engine rules isn't it so i think it'd be like a technicality where he they could move him but i think he would have to keep with the same engine and bike yeah. so yeah but as you say difficult one i mean let's remember when this last happened with Johan zarko you've, you've mentioned it before keith you know, you know they decided look this is too difficult to try and keep a rider that wants to leave for the rest of a season and they decided look it's better if you just leave because if you don't want to ride for us in a year's time why ride for us now contracts contracts are basically financial issues and, and the nuts and bolts if, if if a team or a rider are not happy with what they're doing or where they are or who they're with you might as well let it go. It's, it's it is literally ir irreconcilable differences. You know, you've got to tidy up the financials and um, divvy up the uh, the fifty percent here and there, and off you go. Um, but I cannot believe that Maverick Vinales' management will have not had Plan B up their sleeve. Where is Plan B? What 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 could possibly be in the paddock at the end of this two year period? I mean, everyone's up fairly soon for contract anyway. Um, I wonder what else he's got up his sleeve. You surely wouldn't leave yourself exposed to just Aprilia. What about a year out? There must be... Um... No. No. Nobody does that. I mean, no, nobody apart from Dovi who expects to do that at the moment. I mean, a year out with, with today's... With the pace of today and the way, the, the way things are going, everything changes in a year. Um, you know, look at, Ma look at the, uh, Mark Marquez. He's been out for... 580 days or whatever it was since his last win and it's been a real struggle for him to get back to it a lot of people thought he'd be back on it saxon ring he was but of course this weekend not so and and that's the kind of struggle you have if you take too much time off um motivation all the things that are going on in your head it's in here everyone all these guys are, are top line riders but it's all up north of the eyebrows to um to make it work out on the racetrack but it's all so tight all so close I had a long conversation um, just before we came on air with John Cooper, the, the wonderful JC, um, regarding penalties and stuff like that. He rang me because he's incensed by penalties. He's old school like me and, um, <laughs> and he's incensed by penalties. I'm sure we'll go there in a minute. So I'll bring up some of the comments that John had to say about it. All of them, you know, wonderful. But it, I can't see how he can have a year off. Why would anybody risk in today's marketplace, why would anybody risk the inconsistency of Maverick Vinales in a year's time? It's almost bad enough to risk the inconsistency of Maverick Vinales now, even though we know he can win races given the right set of circumstances. You know, from a team management point of view, you look at the youngsters that are hovering there at the moment. They're, you know, Fernandez. You've, 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 got, you've got so many that are just waiting to go. And it's really just a case of how much a factory team is prepared to pay for someone to break their other factory contract they're already on. That's what it is going to amount to nowadays, is that there's a logjam of really good talent, but it's going to be down to whether a factory is prepared to pay another factory to break that contract, to get that talent. Something's got to move soon. As you say, Keith, the only seats that we know are available there's, there's the Aprilia one, obviously, which seems the overwhelming favourite. There's the VR46 Ducati seat. 
may be interesting. Ducati, they, they made a big bid for Vinales. But the R46, they always have Italian riders. So, you know, who knows? But, and then apart from that, it's, it's the Tech to our KTM, which is, as we've discussed, is, is overflowing with options. So really, I mean, you do wonder if you're Vinales, maybe do you just wait a month and just see if anyone goes, oh, hang on a minute, we've got a clause with our rider. And he's not quite as far as he should be up the chat or something. You know, maybe maybe he just waits to see what comes out of this. But if you're Aprilia, I think, you know, you've been messed around with riders enough for the past year or two. And Aleish was saying yesterday, it was interesting because Aleish, Vinales' teammate at Suzuki, you know, they got on very well. He didn't want to talk at all about Vinales. Now, that's because that was just another sign. It's one of those things where it's not what you say, it's what you don't say that they must be really, really close and they don't want to mess it up, you know. Um, but he was saying, look, I think a lot of these guys that turned down this ride, the Moto2 guys last year that didn't want to ride this bike, he says, I think they're going to regret it. You know, when you look at the bike now, it's, he said, I'm eighth in the championship, you know, and he's, he's consistent with that bike. It's not a bad bike now. As we've said, it's, yeah. not, it's not a world championship winning bike. It's the only bike that hasn't had a win in the past year, not at a podium. But it's far from a disaster bike now and it's made big steps so who knows but it looks can like I, can i play a bit of, yeah can i play a bit of devil's advocate on that one peter i mean at the end of the day they've had concessions and we've been on a, a technology freeze you know when we get back for next year we ain't on a technology freeze they're going to be chucking the kitchen sink at it and as as the little factory at aprilia Noali, have they have they come up with something special for 2022 i wonder i mean i think it's a big gamble i really do if he if he's putting his eggs in the aprilia basket you know next year we're going to see a, a step Everyone's going to be making a step of some sort or another next year because we've been on a, on a technology freeze for the because of the COVID. Um, so I don't know whether Aprilia, yeah, Aprilia, it's a great little motorbike. I mean, it's there or thereabouts, isn't it, at the moment? OK, it's not been higher than sixth place, I don't think it is at, at this moment in time. Aleish, is he, is he, he's a man that gives everything, but is he of the quality of Maverick Vinales? And this is what's going to be going around in people's heads, you know, where is Aleish in that pecking order? You can't really tell, can you? Because you don't really know how good the Aprilia is or isn't. It's, it's there or thereabouts. Aleish is on it. Now, if you'd had your known a here still, if he hadn't been, you know, eating drug laden steak or whatever it was that got him in trouble, then the fact is that we'd have a yardstick to measure that bike by because however nutty you might consider your known a to be, he could ride a bloody motorbike. There's no doubt about that. And he would have been brilliant. You can understand why Aprilia hung on for him because he was really their, their great hope. He, he was a world-class rider, given a few little um, uh, sparkling sideshows that um, he was very good at. Um, Aleish, where is he in that pecking order? See, I think Vinales is a, is, a, is a more likely race winner on any motorbike than Aleish Espargo. That's my personal, personal opinion. Um, so, you know, Aprilia must think that Christmas has all come at once if Maverick Vinales is prepared to come along and race it for them next year. But at the same time, what was that old Kevin Schwantz saying? Next year, he could come apart like a cheap watch. You just don't know. It's a risk, and Vinales, risk for both. Hasn't Vinales, Vinales sort of, and you know, Aprilia. perhaps his stock has fallen down a little bit because, you know, of Quartararo's dominance so far this season. And you could see that the, you, you brought it up uh, just a few minutes ago, Keith, about, you know, this is a mental game as much as anything. And you saw, you know, when they pulled up at the end of the race that Vinales was just so, he just didn't look happy at all. And you could see literally the stark contrast between Quartararo celebrating with the team. And then there's that brilliant shot of Vinales just drinking his water bottle and looking absolutely like just so bitter. So surely, do you think he, he kind of had to go really because he's being absolutely slaughtered by Quartararo? Yeah, well, excuse me on that one. I mean, welcome to the big boys club. Yeah. This is MotoGP. These yeah. guys are getting paid millions of pounds. You know, you've got to get your motorbike sorted. Quattararo and his team on his side of the garage. Yeah, you know, Quattararo, I can't remember what turn it was now. Um, there's a section of uh, Assen. Year on year, the way he's got his bike set up, the thing's giving it a load of this all the way through the corner. I mean, he's, he's, he's tagged. He's, he's not letting it off at all. But the thing's shaking its head. So the way he's got his bike set, it's sensitive in places. Um, my point being is that you've got to either ride round or set up round whatever the problem with the bike is. Not delivering your grip at the rear or not delivering your grip at the front. You've got to work that out with your crew chief and you've got to do the best you can do with it. 
it's no good whinging about what you've got. And it's no good sometimes looking the other side of the garage. Otherwise, everybody that had been in a Repsol Honda camp would have thrown the towel in halfway through the year because yeah. Mark Marquez <laughs> does everything different to everyone else. So it's not it's kind of a valid point harry but but not in my view as a as, a, as an ex-rider you know you, you're given a pile of poop and you've got to sort it out you know you've got to you've got to you know get it in a position where you can ride the thing properly and you, you've got to get the best out of it and keep digging in this is this is a gritty sport on and off track and and you know i i don't know i kind of feel sorry for vinales he, he definitely has a, a, a head problem there is no doubt in my mind he has a head problem. There, you know, all of his problems are, like I say, north of the eyebrows. That bike might not be perfect in a lot of places for him and clearly for Valentino as well, bearing in mind they're in two different camps nowadays. Um, but you've got to work around it. And Quattararo should be an inspiration rather than something to you know blow your brains on. You know, you look across the garage and think, ah, great. he can do it, he's doing it, what's he doing, how's it working? Why can't we do it? Yeah, Vinales, he was the only man on the grid to go with a soft front tyre. Huh? Why would you do that? I mean, it's, it's, obviously because, it's obviously because he likes the feel of it. But Alex Briggs, the most respected, one of the most respected, you know, chiefs of, of the crew variety in the paddock no longer, back in Australia and enjoying himself in a retirement. Um, but Alex Briggs commented, you know, if... He thought he was going to be able to get away in front with a soft front tire on, not being in a crowd. Because obviously, when you're as soon as you're in a crowd, as soon as you're having to, to force it to fit everywhere, and you've got all that hot air around you coming off the bikes in front, your tire starts to overheat, and it blows up like a balloon. So you have a less of a contact patch. If you get me with that, you know, as soon as the tire pressure increases, you've got a harder, you know, harder tire, and, and not the squidge that you need from from a front or rear tire. And they set the tire pressure so that they expect it to go to a certain uh, tire pressure when it's at working temperature but you've got different working temperatures when you're in a crowd or when you're out front now if he set it up to be out front um, then once he got stuck in a bit of a crowd early on which Van Vinales tends to do because he's useless at starting then he's got a problem if he set it for being in a in a in a group um, and then he goes out front and he's got all clean air in front of him then he's got a problem there as well the, the soft front tire for me as soon as I saw that I remember thinking why is he doing that? If you're in any doubt at all, look along the road, put on what everyone else has got on, because generally it works. Um, but to be the only man out of the whole grid that, that went for a soft front, I, I don't get what goes on in his head. That was a huge talking Does point, anybody? wasn't it? Pete, did you get anything from him from you know the post-race uh, press conferences? Because it looked like he sort of stood by that decision. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the whole press conference was bizarre, wasn't it? Because it started yeah. off with, with, a, with kind of a complete denial that he was going to leave Yamaha and go to Aprilia. And then what followed was about a million reasons why he might well leave Yamaha, wasn't it? So uh, it was just, it, it, yeah, it just followed on from what you say, the scenes after the race of, of just looking completely dejected. And you got poor old Massimo Marigali, the team manager, trying to get him to join in. And it was just awkward, wasn't it? Um, yeah, all we really understood from that pretty bizarre press conference was that, you know, Maverick, the Saxon ring thing, finishing last, was obviously a big issue. And, and, and the fact this didn't really leak out, you know, this, this whole move, this whole split came out all at once, shows you it happened really quickly. So it was a, just a quick decision, I think. But his former management knew about it because he broke it, didn't he? Uh, I think he got broke on Twitter. It was one of his former aides, if you like, that, that, that got it out there. And, and, and it's someone that really, really was in the know. But I thought uh, you mentioned the, the 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 body language between the team and, and Maverick on the podium. Oh, awkward or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah, it, it was awkward, wasn't it, Pete? It was just it was a pain to watch. And then and then, but it was yeah, it was really random how he would just it flat out denied the rumours. And then suddenly, was that just? Oh, the ink wasn't dry, huh? Harry. The ink <laughs> wasn't dry. <laughs> I, it's all hey, it's all my guess in today. Answer this then. One thing we do know is that Vinales is off. Jack Peterson has asked, if you were Yamaha, who is top of the shopping list? Oliveira maybe? Or would they try and poach someone like Acosta? Promote from within? What's your money on? Well, mine's Morbidelli. I think I've said that already. Mm. I mean, I think Morbidelli would be the right shout morally and, you know, on track as well. I mean, he's due. Um but then again, you can go a bit left of field, can't you, with these things? And it comes back down to what I said a minute ago, Pete. Who's going to pay to break other people's contracts? 
Aprilia. Actually, significantly, Aprilia. Were you no, no, I was just going to say, you, you, know, you mentioned previously the, the, the Petronas team sort of had to accept Rossi, you know, and it wasn't part of their plan. They didn't set up their team trying to sign Valentino Rossi. And it was, well, you've got Rossi now. I'm just wondering, you know, Morbidelli has a contract with Petronas for next year. If they now also lose their top guy to the factory team, it's just, you know, another one. I mean, like, like he's saying, it makes sense. You know, he's the, he's the obvious guy to go into that seat. But you're just thinking the Petronas team yet again have someone mess with their rider lineup. You know, something happens outside of their team that just ends up going, you know. But doesn't it, doesn't it come that, back down as well to what I said weeks ago, that, that Yamaha always seem to be behind the ball? They're, they're never behind. They're behind the game all the time. They're never quite on it. Like KTM, they've got a, a a whole train of youngsters coming through. You know, someone's going to have to pay them big money. What I was going to say before we got to that was that Aprilia denied that they were going to pay to break Yamaha's contract. Um, they put it out there. I think Rivola, um, team manager, the old F1 guy that's in there now, the young F1 guy, I should say, that's in there now. Just my language. Um, he <laughs> he denied that they would pay to break. Um, Yamaha's contract. Um, so right now they're going to get, you know, the eight million dollar man, possibly for free. <laughs> That's a deal of a decade for Aprilia, if it works. Head of a signing. But yeah. I was just going to. Yeah. I mean, also there's not just the factory seat, of course. There's there's the, the Valentino Rossi seat, which is, you know, I mean, he said himself it's looking very difficult for next year. So and we should know more by the by the Austrian rounds after the summer break. So Yamaha need two riders, not just one. Uh, you know, they, they've got obviously Garrett Gerloff was was having what you could see was maybe an audition this this weekend. You, you, you hear rumours about Toprak, you know, the, the Turkish star. Oh, yeah. You know, he's Top Ralph Fernandez, you know, does this change everything? The fact that Yamaha, we've been saying they've now got a whole load of money that they're saving for next year. Suddenly the fee to buy Ralph Fernandez out of his contract. No problem. You know, half a million euros, you know, they, they're going to save what? Five million at least. So. Does does that change change everything? I mean, it, there's a whole list of names, even Marco Bezzecchi, uh, uh, you know, maybe. But who... yeah, but in a perfect in, in a perfect world, you would say that Ralph Fernandez, yes, they should buy him out of his contract anyway because he's such a talent. It is only five hundred thousand, <laughs> only. Um, but it's a lot less than the likes of Maverick Vinales and Co. But really, the natural place for someone like Rail to go, if you were running a ladder would be through the SRT team, from the Sepang Racing team, to, to Petronas. It wouldn't be straight in a factory team. It, well, it shouldn't be, by rights, because having only had one year in Moto2 and then suddenly you're stuck in a full factory Yamaha team, I think that's a step too far, personally. Um, especially when you've got a ladder uh, team like Petronas that you could place him in. And, and, and the fit is really wonderful. I mean, that, that pastoral care that I was mentioning earlier, that the Maverick is obviously missing since Suzuki, you get that at Sepang Racing Team. Razan Razali, Joanne Stigelfeld, what a great team. Quite good at that. Although I know one young Scott that might be arguing with my point there at some point. <laughs> they haven't looked after him perhaps quite as well as they should. I'm talking John Maffey, of course, for anybody that um, is only just tuning into this podcast and doesn't listen to us often. But, you know, John McPhee, obviously, he's been, he was stuffed last year when he should have had a Moto 2 ride this year. And they kept Jake Dixon, so there wasn't one for him. And then this year, they've nicked his crew chief to move to Jake Dixon as well. So he either hates the team or hates Jake Dixon. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> but Fee wouldn't. He's a lovely, lovely man, and I and I know he'll take it professionally. But it. My point being, it's quite ruthless, isn't it? In, in MotoGP. I've kind of contradicted myself because I said pastorally. Um, <laughs> the they care kind for of you, but they also people. don't. <laughs> but when when needs must, <laughs> out comes it's the saw. <laughs> it's sport, it's business, isn't it? Now, you mentioned Garrett Gerloff there, obviously making uh, a debut in MotoGP, replacing uh, Frankie Morbidelli due to his knee surgery, the young American coming in. And it looked like a pretty decent run from him, actually, considering, you know, first time on the bike, first time handling wet conditions as well earlier on the weekend. Uh, do you think he's realistically put himself in the frame for a seat while we're on the subject of Yamaha? I'd say it was too early, personally. He had that go last year in Valencia. Um, you know, in practice, and he really acquitted himself very well in difficult conditions. Um, this weekend was a bit more of a wake-up call. I mean, the Cathedral of Speed, mm. Assen, um, and all that goes with it, it's a massive step for Gerloff. But I think he acquitted himself pretty well. But, I mean, that, you've got a couple of things here, haven't you? 
Dawn are keen to get an American back into it at the top level. They're keen to get a Brit back into it at the top level. Cal Crutchlow, something else that I don't understand. You know, like they've got Cal Crutchlow as a test rider, but really with the amount of testing they can do, it must be the best job Cal's ever had to get paid for sitting on his sofa talking about it. You'll really appreciate that playing with Willow instead of bloody um, out there grinding off the laps in some sweaty Italian <laughs> racetrack. Um, so Cal's... I, I, they need a Brit. They need an American. The Aussies are coming. You know, Remy's there. So they're, get, they're getting the Australian market back on track as well. I mean, Dorna are doing all they can to make this work. But top rack. I mean, what's the Turkish market like, I wonder, for motorcycles? Because it's a big country, 80-odd million people there. It must be a big market that's opening. Um, and again, that's a, something that everybody considers when they're thinking about riders. Top rack for me, Razgali Olgu, I, I love the bloke. I mean, I think that he's got personality. He's, you know, if you want to tick corporate boxes, he's of a different religion to most people. He's come from a part of the world that, you know, you know Keenan Sokoroglu was was outstanding back in the day. Um, but that was in super sport. But to, to have a top Turk in MotoGP and one as, what's the word I'm looking for, with the flair that he's got, and the personality that he's got. I think mean, he'd be a real asset to, to MotoGP. But is the Turkish market the one that Dorna really want to be in? or Because this, this is the other influence that comes into it. It's not just the factory. It's the, it's the global marketplace. Well, Phil Coombs actually said, uh, Pete, he's asked, you know, why Garrett Gerloff for not Top Rack? Surely Top Rack is the most deserving Yamaha rider in, in the World Superbikes. Well, this, of course, <laughs> assumes that Top Rack wasn't offered it first. Um, we don't know. Now, oh. it's certainly possible. Uh, you hear... Yeah, you well, hear rumours that uh, I was just, that Top Rack, he doesn't want to go in and risk everything on one race. You know, it's a hard thing to do, isn't it? When when this is the one impression that you might make in the MotoGP paddock and you're just dropped in, as Keith says, at Assen, you know, no testing. There you go. And then if you don't have a good weekend, oh, oh well, you know, he's 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 not ready for me or whatever, you know. So I think that that possibly... We don't know what the order was. I mean, Cal officially is the, is the Yamaha replacement rider. So clearly Yamaha wanted to put somebody different to Cal because they wanted to give someone a chance to potentially sign for next year. That's all we can, you know, we can deduce that much. And then you've got all the Yamaha superbike riders really potentially could be on it. Um, yeah, but there's, there's a sugary drink department you've got to think about as well. Who's on Monster and who's on Red Bull? You know, these are things that... that also, who's wearing what cap? Mm. You know, you, you've, you've got sort of side contracts that are quite lucrative that are, that, are, that are both team and rider. If you've got a conflict there, then there's a there's immediate problems as well. You know, Cal has always been a monster man. Um, Yamaha a monster. Um, watch out for that infiltrating Red Bull. It can be a can be a snag that. Um, I mean, there aren't that many rider managers in the paddock really, because you tend to find that one manager has got you know three, four, five riders that are signed to him um and they're all around the back of the buses yank, 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 trying to do these deals behind the trucks it's great sport to go and watch them in a paddock when you whenever we get back there again i'd love to be there now because you'd walk around a truck and there'd be like two of them nose to nose <laughs> discussing the, the 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 schedule of where they want their riders to go and what they think they're ready for and what the finances of it are and all the rest of it I always used to feel a bit sorry for Roger Burnett, who obviously looks after Sam Lowe's, because Roger Burnett, the former Grand Prix rider as well, but um, Roger only had Sam Lowe's in the paddock, so he only had one man to really negotiate with, whereas all the others had like three or four that they could sort of place into the, the Jenga pile of talent. And uh, But you, it's great fun when you you run around the corner, you, you're about to go and do your next job, and you run around the corner, and then there'll be two very serious <laughs> managers stuck in, in the toilets or somewhere where they... You know, trying to beat the next deal out of each other. It's quite good fun. It's a to sport watch. in itself, it's a isn't sport it? In itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move on though for a little bit to uh, third place man, Joao Mir. Good run to third from tenth uh, yet again from that row of the grid. He said he's really encouraging Suzuki though to to work hard this summer because they've still got to find some outright pace, particularly in qualifying because he clearly got it in the races, but the qualifying is just setting him back, isn't it? Come on, Keith. Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of feels like we've been here with a Suzuki. Um, you know, Jaya Mir, 
Alex Rins, who's got the most pace this year? It looks like Rins has, to be honest, with, with one way and another. But they're not quite there, are they? It, I, I'd like to know what they've got in the pipeline for next year. You know, next year is critical for Suzuki. I think this year really is is, is not going to be their year, it would seem. And what can they do in the summer break? You know, there's... There's not much well, that's that actually really my question. Can, How can, much can be done? Well, because obviously, in for, coming from a well, four-wheel car, there's a full you shutdown. You analyse everything. You you analyse everything. You, what you do is you go back over the ground you've gone over. It's a bit like a, it's a cold case file in a murder. <laughs> oh God! You're yeah. looking back over the evidence. You're trying to work out, you know, what what have we missed here? What what can where can we find that tiny degree? And we're only talking tiny degrees. I mean. Some bloke wrote to me with some angst earlier on today on Twitter that, that said, you know, like Valentino Rossi, he's still fast. He's only a second behind. He's, you know, he's not done with yet and all the rest of it. And I'm thinking, mate, you've missed the boat. You know, a second nowadays is a tenth from before. You know, it's, it's a second is, is like, forget a it. Lifetime. It's, it's no longer credible. Yeah, and then that's, that's the problem you have now. And, and bringing it back to the Suzuki example is that, they're looking for thousands of a second. These are tiny, tiny improvements that they're looking to. Everyone's going to be looking. It ain't just Suzuki. You know, everyone's going to be doing exactly the same thing, pouring over the data and trying to work out where they might find something extra. If there's one thing that if you look at what does the Suzuki need, it's that rear ride height device, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's the, if you were to try and, because like he says, you know, Everything else is data set of everything else. But if you, if you just look at the bikes, compare it to the other bikes, what has it not got? It's, it hasn't got this rear ride height device. So that's got to be something that they're working on. You know, the riders are pushing for it. Maybe it'll be ready in Austria. Who knows? But outside of that, it's just details and details and details, as, as, as Keith's saying. I think that ride height device, I think we're going to see that when he comes back. I mean, that, that's probably the only thing that's a big chunk that they can, they can, they can grab something. I mean, uh, you know, Tracks where you've got to make the start, where you've got to be on the front two rows of the grid. Um, you can't lose that qualifying position. Not that they qualify that well anyway, actually. That, you know, the ride height thing will give them a hand off the line. But first of all, you've got to get it on the front two rows of the grid, which seems to be a bit of a problem for um, Mir in particular. So they've got a bit of work to do. But the riders as well. Yeah. This is going to make you smile slightly. I was giving my daughter a driving lesson last night. And I... And I said, I tried to make the analogy to a, to a Grand Prix team. I don't know how the hell or why I was even thinking it. It never stops in my head. And I was saying to her, look, it's no good going out for two or three hours and doing the same stuff because you'll make the same mistakes. Well, what you need to do is have an hour, go home, drink, Analyze think the about data. it, drink tea, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Download the data in your head. It's exactly the same thing. You can, you can make it as simple as a learner try for learning. You know, Think about what you're doing. Think about where the improvement could be made, and then you'll automatically make it when you get out on the track next time. And riders will be looking at themselves as well, inwardly, as well as all the technical stuff that the teams will be doing. The riders will be looking at themselves. Now, where can I improve? And they'll be going out over every race, every corner, every breaking point. It's a wonderful exercise. I, you know, I interviewed uh, Valentino Rossi on stage at Silverstone. Seems like a hell of a long time ago now. but And I said to him, do you do the same work as all the kids? Do you, do you still look at all the data? Do you still watch all the videos? And he looked at me like I was stupid because, of course, I was stupid because, of course, he does do that. That's what you do when you're a top-line rider. Analyse everything. And that's exactly what even Valentino, at 40 years old, 41 years old as he was when I was interviewing him, uh, he still looks over every single thing on the PlayStation, looking if there's anything even in a PlayStation game that might be of, of, of use to try and find an advantage. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about, mechanically and physically. Well, the crucial and question for that, of course, is how does your daughter take that? <laughs> no choice. <laughs> Team manager. <laughs> no more lessons otherwise. So I think she's yeah. off to find another team. There's some manager deals going on. Well, um, Mir is currently in fourth, one point uh, ahead of Miller and eight behind Bagnaia in a Ducati sandwich, um, which sort of brings us nicely on to uh, Ducati, Ducati. Let's talk about actually um, Pramak Zarko, fastest independent. Uh, but it was an overall struggle, I think he said for him. You know, the, the win was never really in sight. Zarko knew it would be a difficult race, but crucial points for him in, in a championship challenge. But do you think it's slightly fading? Well, let's have a little think about that first of all. Bang Naya got a bloody 
ride through. Otherwise, yep. he'd have been right Correct. there on a Ducati. He had a ride through for exceeding track limits. I'm sure we'll get to the track limits. Um, Don't you worry. Minutes. I've had enough of that now. Um, Jack Miller basically fell down and damaged the bike and got a black and orange flag in the end. So that took him out of it as well. Um, so I think Ducati were a little bit unlucky. It's not really a Ducati track, is it? Um, perhaps, unless the weather had turned slightly, which is where my betting was going. Yes, who was your prediction again? It was, uh, yes, you were Miller, weren't you? Yeah, oh no. Miller. Poor day for Miller. <laughs> and actually, Pete... Oh no. Again, Pete. oh no, oh no. Pete, well, no, Pete no. was all of that. I'm just happy because I finally got a point on the board. <laughs> yeah, I can. Um, but no, you. I think you're right there. I'll tell you what, I... I... I can't believe the two of us had first choice over Harry and we let him have Quattararo. We're just oh, too much It's like all even now better. going into the summer break. It's perfect. Um, but you're right. You, you know, Ducati did show pace, particularly with Banyai. We had a great scrap for the lead as well. Paid the ultimate price for track limits with a long lap penalty. Uh, but he really, uh, he, if he hadn't have had that, it would have been a real proper battle, do you think, with Quattararo to the very end? <laughs> no. <laughs> Quater- oh, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think Quattararo had pace. I think Quattararo was riding a very smart race. He was on a motorbike that worked for him around there, and um, I couldn't see him being beaten, to be honest, in the end. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that stood out for me for the Ducati was the ride height device. You know, you saw for lap after lap with Banyaya, Marquez and Aleish, and, and Aleish spoke about it. He said, we were faster than him, but we just couldn't get by him. As soon as he, you know, the back of that bike dropped down out of the last chicane, it just rocketed away. And, and bear in mind, they've also got the, you know, the ride height device. It's not like it's against the Suzuki that doesn't have one. And yet the Ducati one just seems to work so much you know, better than even, even the other bikes. I think it's called um, Allied with Horsepower, Peter. It's, got, it's, it's maximizing... <laughs> The, the horsepower that the Ducati has. I mean, unfortunately, wheel spin is a thing that's a, a real thing on on big old bloody MotoGP bikes. And if you can manage that, minimize the amount of wheel spin you're getting, that means that the traction isn't banging in on you, traction control's not banging in on you, and and it's driving forwards. And I think out of somewhere like the chicane where you, you know, you're on it on your side through there trying to get it to hook up, and it sits down as, and points the thing in a. I mean, Ducati have definitely got it sorted out. Um, but again, you know, you know, everyone else is going to be looking at that when we get back. But rear wheel grip has been a problem with the with the Honda or with the Yamaha. That's something that we've been hearing quite a lot about. Um, I was kind of surprised and not surprised that Mark ended up in seventh place. I mean, still the best Honda. Uh, I, I had a, a bit of a Takagami feeling for a while. I thought that maybe Takagami after after um, free practice and qualifying might just come up with something a bit special but in the end the honda challenge fell away on race day he looked like he was on the verge of tears as well again i was just gonna say yeah he, he looked really really disappointed again yeah uh, and, and mark earlier in the weekend actually paid him quite a compliment when he said that you know of all the other riders with with the riding style for the honda taka looks like he's he's you know getting quite a long way there with it if you like of how to ride it from the day he came into the LCR team, I remember Cal Crutto saying he can really ride a MotoGP bike. He was really impressed with him straight away. And that's, you know, Cal's, Cal's a good bloke. He, I mean, he sort of tells you how it is. And uh, for him to say that, you believe him straight away. There was no reason for him to say it other than the fact that that's what he'd seen, that he could see something that Taka can ride a MotoGP bike straight away from the get-go. Um, the bloke is certainly due, isn't he, Nakagami? A result of um, something special. But when it will come, I don't know. He's still going to be looking back to the likes of, where was it, Aragon? But they, they were... They were to think about it now. His they weren't slating him win. too much, but they were saying that, you know, there was a lot of mistakes coming in from Nakagami yet again. But it, it felt like if they were mistakes, they were very minuscule mistakes that just unfortunately were compounded by once one gets through, then they all come through. Well, I think a minuscule mistake is what you don't make nowadays. That's what I was saying earlier. It's a thousand to thousandths of a second. You, you, you know, you, you, there is no room for any any. These guys, they're like I said before, they're the guys they're that are earning the top money. They are the top riders. They should not make mistakes. It's it's, and he will be frustrated. The worst kind of criticism is your own. It's not about what other people say on Twitter. The worst <laughs> kind of criticism as a rider is when you know you've mucked up in a certain way. It might only be a minimal amount, but you've mucked up. You've not got the best from that package. And it's, it crucifies you. When you come back in, you don't need a crew chief or a bloody data sheet to look at to, to work it out. 
you already know. Lap on lap, you know where you made a very slight mistake here and there. And that that goes back to even you know the year dot. Any any self-respecting rider analyzes exactly what they've done or haven't done during the course of a race and, and tries to put that right. And at this level, Tacker obviously felt that you know he'd made one or two too many mistakes. It's cruel, but hey, it's what we said before. It's the big boys and you're you're earning the bucks. Get on with it. And certainly those small mistakes, it was illustrated in practice because we were seeing lap after lap for, for Tacker being cancelled for track limits, which is exactly what you're saying, Keith. So it was almost like he would barely get a completed lap because it was cancelled, cancelled, cancelled. And as he says, you just can't make those mistakes um, at this level. Coming back to Mark, he, he, he was pretty happy. And bear in mind, he was 20th on the grid, wasn't he? It was a night, it was worst ever qualifying. Um, and this I'd, was I'd, a right. I'd been happy to have survived. <laughs> after that five. accident yeah 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 um and he was saying yeah right hand track this was his best the first time he's really been competitive on the right hand tracks if you like you know which is the bad side for his arm um he felt the bike had the pace for the podium so he you know he's feeling better about it but i mean he was it was another as he says another massively lucky escape with that high side on the friday scary to watch that wasn't it um well go go on then when are we getting freddie on um keith, uh, keith? because uh <laughs> yet again it's I'll another be, weekend I'll... full of full of controversy full of penalties track limits it's all going on yet again i've started writing my freddie Uh-oh. spencer <laughs> question list <laughs> and it starts right at the beginning look i i i spoke with freddie a couple of weeks ago he was quite keen at that point and and i i, I think that what I'll try and do is ring him again this week, if I can, and ask him when he'll join us on this good old conference call. <laughs> and we'll give him some space. I mean, I know you guys will, because you're very respectful. And I mean, I, Freddie, Freddie's a hugely talented man. He's an astute, clever, analytical fellow, not to mention a bloody good rider. Um, it wouldn't be a stitch up job from any of us three, that's for sure, because the three of us aren't interested in that. But it will be interesting to get to the bottom of how the process works. I want to I want to know more about the other two guys that are in there with him. You know, how much influence do they have on decisions he makes? You know, do, are, because as far as I'm concerned, they're non-entities. I'm sorry to say that, but they're just they're just you know corporate bods that are in there as a committee. And I, I and as a person, I have real difficulty with committees anyway, um, just because you know you can talk round and round in circles. What's right is right. What's reasonable is reasonable. JC, I said that I spoke to John Cooper earlier on today. Lovely bloke, John Cooper. Um, and we talked about penalties because that's what all ex-motorbike racers talk about. Um, and he was saying it's ruining the race and it's ridiculous, da, 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 which I can understand. And I explained to him that the reason why you know penalties are such an issue nowadays, track limit penalties particularly, is because we're now measuring to a thousandth of a second, three thousandths of a second, sorry. It's, it's out to, no, a thousandth of a second, three decimal points. That's where we're going to. I think it should be four personally because we're that tight nowadays sometimes you'll get two or three riders to three decimal points on exactly the same time and when you are riding when everything is that tight you cannot allow even a degree of advantage to anybody you know otherwise you're doing the sport down back in the day i remember when i first started racing around mallory park they measured it to a tenth of a second a tenth of a second is from here to the other side of the village <laughs> in real terms you know it's, it's kind of like Tenth of a second. Well, you might as well start off with one of them bloody egg timers, you know, or, or wait till the sun comes round on the <laughs> dial. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it's it's kind of like, and the reason why these penalties are there as much as anything is is fairness. It's it's safety, of course, but it's also fairness when you've got a sport that's so tight, so incredibly tight, to allow someone a thousandth of a second advantage over another rider onto a straight. You've got a thousand of a second advantage through a corner onto a straight because you've gone over the, you've used that extra bit of track. Um, you are going to be two or three thousandths of a second better off by the time you get to the end of the straight. That's how it works. You know, it's, it's how early you can tap the throttle on, how late you can get on the brakes. It's all, it's all relative. So I can understand the penalties, but where John, getting back to JC and what he said was, he said it should be that if there has been no advantage, that's when they can apply the penalty. So if you if you run off because you've had a nudge or whatever it might be, but you haven't gained an advantage, 
And I can see where he's coming from with that. That it sounds almost reasonable, but then it comes down to human error. Then Freddie and his boys back in the stewards box. It's suddenly not clear cut. It's then their opinion whether it was an advantage or not. And then you've got the data from the teams that's very, very accurate, believe me. And they will be able to tell you more than anybody looking in by eyesight whether there was or wasn't an advantage. It's a minefield. I, I, I nominated Freddie when it came to, they were looking for someone to, to do the stewards job. And I remember making the nomination to Mike Trimby um, back in the day. Um, because I know how analytical that Freddie is. And I kind of wish I hadn't, because I feel sorry for Freddie. He gets so much crap for trying to do the job as best as he can. And he's got no bias. It's not like it. And he's not stupid. Like, you know, like when you read Twitter, you'd think this guy, would, you know, wasn't capable of doing his job. He absolutely is. So I think getting back to what you said, Harry, I'll speak with him this week and hopefully we can get him on for, for next Tuesday. But don't hold your breath just yet because I don't know what your schedule is. Well, we've got five weeks. Or where he is. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Well, but we might as well strike while the iron's hot. And it's going to okay. take him four of them to get over it with yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> nice little holiday. That's we're finished yeah, with him. Perfect holiday for the podcast. Um, well, look, let's... And, may, and maybe maybe too, I think, as I said, maybe Stuart Higgs would, yeah. would like to join in as well. You know, MSVR race director. I mean, Stuart... Stuart is a, is a is another one that I have huge respect for. I mean, he's ruthless when it comes to rules because pretty much he made them. Um, but his thinking is usually quite... Where I think BSB scores is their transparency in their rules. And their and the fact is, is that they seem, they're they interpreted by one person, which gets us over this committee thing. That's why we, committees always... It always seems a little later getting the, the written you know details of, of why that penalty was applied and I think with Higgsy where he scores more than anything is that he makes the you know he's made the decision like that and you'd be very hard to find a decision that Higgs has made that's been wrong in fact I can't think of a time I've seen a, a, a rule applied by Stuart Higgs in BSB where it's been wrong you know borderline sometimes um, and you don't quite understand it but as soon as you speak to Stuart Higgs and he's quite willing to justify his position and, and the position of the rule, um, you go, oh, yeah, I get that now. Yeah, all right, Stuart. You know, you back off straight away. He's never, I've never been able to get an advantage over him when it comes to rulemaking. Um, so it would be wonderful to have him on here as well. Um, perhaps uh, he'll join us in the next week or two. He's not shy, so I'm sure he will. <laughs> <laughs> he loves a bit of camera time. Well, we'll try and uh, make sure we get something for you during this summer break. I'm sure Keith is on the case. Let's move it on, though, to... Uh, actually, no, before we go to Moto3 and Moto2, a couple of questions that have come in uh, just on various different topics. So just going to pick your brains on this first one. Jeremy Bartle. Um, we often hear how it's impossible to get bike fit by training in the gym. Why is this? I have a friend who trains professional athletes in several other sports, but they have never heard of this and can't see why it would be the case. Great podcast. Good to still hear from Keith. That's from Jeremy. Jeremy, bike fit. When you're training, you know, you're moving the muscles in a certain way in alliance with your brain. It's a kind of, it's not just bike fit as in physical. It's how this is working with everything else. It's, it's, the, it's the, the whole package. When you're bike fit, you are using things in conjunction with your brain, in conjunction with reflex, in conjunction with the, the outside forces that you won't get in a gym. You know, you can be, your overall fitness will be like any athlete. I mean, I have to say that the MotoGP riders nowadays you know, if I go back to the day when I was racing in MotoGP, they just laugh at me. Um, you know, you're talking Mick Doohan type fitness. Mick Doohan was the first animal when it came to, to crazy fitness, unbelievable fitness. Now they're all like it. Um, you know, to such a point that you can make phone calls and crash into the back of Dorna van. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. <laughs> but bike fit is about the, you're moving muscles, reactions, um, reflexes, all as one, all in a natural environment to racing a motorcycle. And I think that's what's meant by bike fit. It's not that you are, uh, it's not that you're fitter in certain muscle areas or muscle group particularly, because you're pretty much got, done that anyway. But there are certain things that you can exercise when you're on a motorcycle that you're not gonna really be able to replicate that easily in a gym, for instance. 
you know, running, what's, what, what does that do for anything? I mean, yeah, okay, aerobically, you, you, it keeps you, you, you sharp. Cycling, cycling is probably quite a good one because you, you, you've got that kind of thigh area when you're, you're moving yourself from side to the side of the bike, you're putting a lot of leg action through the footrest and the like to, to position the bike into and out of corners and so on and so forth. There's a, there's a lot more going on when you're racing a motorbike than I think a lot of people could, could actually um, vouch for having if you've never done it then mm. you won't perhaps understand it but it is it's a very physical it, actually there was a bsb here here we go another bloody shout for bsb i don't know why when we're on a moto gp podcast but anyway there was a, a wonderful uh onboard camera that uh, it was a helmet cam i think it was i can't remember who was running it now was it one of the honda guys i think it was it was on a it's on twitter anyway uh, you'll have to look it look it up for the bsb um and you sit for the first time with an onboard camera, you get a real feeling of a lap of Alton Park and how physical it is. It's brilliant. I highly recommend it. If you, if you get an opportunity to look at it, please do. Um, it's out there somewhere. But you can see how much effort, how much the bike's moving. You never get that with an onboard camera that's bolted to the bike because they always seem a little bit. But when it's bolted to your body and you can see how much this thing you're going through, just a lap on your own without having other bikes around you that's interfering with your aero you know when you're in a braking point and someone snips your front you know your braking area and so on and so forth so many more things that could be depicted uh, i think we've gone a bit too clinical with cameras um you know you show a slow-mo of a guy that's about to hit the floor at 120 mile an hour and he looks oh he just bounces a little bit you know the airbag pops up you know the the, the mark marquez accident you know so someone at home, oh, look at that. Oh, that was quite big, wasn't it? Big? It would have shattered every bone from my neck to my toe. It been me. Um, you know, I think that the cameras nowadays have become so bloody sterile. But this this particular one was a, was a, obviously a, a, a stuck-on-the-helmet type thing. God, I remember all the hairs on... And talking about it now, all the hairs are going uh, up on my hands now thinking about it. It's just so exciting to watch. Well, brilliant. Well, hopefully, anyway, Jeremy, that has uh, you know, answered I I your question enough. about... Uh, how we get bike fit. Um, one more for you before we move on to Moto3. Barry Allen, and we have talked about this before, but he's asked, uh, do you think qualifying, for example, Q1 and Q2, should be changed to add a Q3 that is a top six shootout for pole where they have a one lap flyer, mainly to stop all this tagging another rider and when a rider's on a fastest lap and he gets blocked or a yellow flag comes out and he misses his fast lap. That's what Barry is. So a change to qualifying, do you think that's a... And that's a feasible route to go down. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Barry's. I think everybody behind the garages is looking at how on earth they're going. I mean, it's, it's translating now to MotoGP. We've started having MotoGP blokes dawdling around looking for someone to aim at, yeah. which is, mm. yeah. Once it once it's starting to move to to them as well, it's it's got to the point of being ridiculous. Well, it already is ridiculous to be honest in Moto Three, and hugely dangerous. You know, I've been in a situation where other riders have tagged somebody that's traveling slowly. Um, unfortunately, I was in exactly that same situation 33 years ago, where my bike basically cut out on, on Cadwell Park Strait as we came out onto the, to the straight and it, it rolled off, which is the equivalent of a bike dawdling. And Kenny Irons was, was unsighted, didn't see everyone parted around me. And Kenny just, just gently tapped me from behind, but of course, tipped him over and he lost his life you can go to silverstone in 1983 um the irish kid that was hit the back of peter huber um when he was traveling norman norman brown he was traveling slowly out of stowe corner when he got either a breakdown or was going to come in or whatever it was and he got hit and, you know the rider behind dodged him and, and, and Peter Huber didn't. He came through unsighted and hit him. I've seen these accidents and they are huge when they happen. Um, you know, we lost a kid the other day that was hit amidships, you know, chasing the Pasquier. The only time you're going to get seriously injured is when you get caught up with something else, when you hit a barrier or a bike hits you or, or whatever it might be. They're, they're, the, they're the incidents that we've got to really cut out and they're unnecessary. These kind of situations where you only need one rider to be unsighted and he's pulling 100 mile an hour plus and the rider's dawdling around at 40 mile an hour and the, and the contact um, closing speed is so high not to mention the fact that you might have someone else that might clout you when you're down it's got to be stopped 
one way or another. So the, the question is is serious, and everybody in MotoGP, Moto2, Moto3, Erta, Dorna, the FIM, will be considering it, will be thinking about it. This five-week break, you know, they might have a couple of extra wines going into the five-week break, but then everybody is going to be working hard on where the second half of the season goes and what changes they can make going through into 2022. And qualifying is going to have to change. I mean, we can't have Super Pole or stuff like that. I hate that kind of thing. And I'm sure the fans, it takes away the spectacle of it. Um, but there has to be some incentive. I think the team should be penalised more, personally. I mean, normally I would say, Peter, that teams are very smart entities. People within teams, technically, politically, are very, very sharp people. But then you get a situation where dozens of riders over the year miss the final lap uh, in their qualifying period because they haven't sent them out on time. So clearly these guys ain't that smart. And clearly these guys can't tell the time because otherwise they would get their time in. I, I sit there sometimes in commentary, not so much now, but I'm on my sofa now, so it gives me even more time to look at it. And I think, what? I could get them out on time from my sofa if I rang them up. I don't understand why they still miss their last qualifying lap. And the same thing applies as why there isn't a situation where management are controlling what their riders are doing, where they put them out on track and so on and so forth. Why they're not sharing the responsibility between the two men team to make it work. Yeah, okay, if they want a slipstream, go out together. They're two team, you know, two team members and make it work during the session. They're very small sessions, only 15 minutes. So at the end of the day, I can see where that can be a problem. So my view would be, yes, there needs to be something else done. Sorry, it took me this long to get to it. Yes, there needs something else doing, but I would fine the team big money. I would fine the team. Riders are irresponsible by nature. They're just going to try and look for an advantage every which way. They're going to fib about what they were doing. Yeah, I had a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all rubbish. Don't don't trust a rider when he's trying to find the best time because he's, he's just going to tell you a lie. So find the team. Make it the team's responsibility to bring their rider into line. Okay. See well, where that goes. Barry Allen, there's your answer. We'll see. Uh, is it... I could they re- is is it possible i suppose within the regulations that they could suddenly change in this break how qualifying works is that possible so well, th- theoretically I, they change I mean, something in the middle of, of this break and then come austria we have a new qualifying format that they want to test out dawn can do anything they want dawn yeah. are the boss um <laughs> don't argue with them but I, I would find it i would find it unusual that they might know and to be honest, I'm not much. I think what they can do is they can apply the penalties they already have in their book. I mean, I like the yeah, fact we've okay. got a very thin rule book. It gives the, the organisers a bit more autonomy into what they can do. But it clearly isn't working. You know, the fact that a Costa can win from a pit lane start, the fact that you can have a two lap penalty and still win. Um, we've seen penalties given. And to be honest, it's, it's made a difference to some riders in overall race finish. But I think once you start fining teams who are already on a fine line regarding their finances, once you start fining teams, um, I think you'll find a, a bigger difference there. I think that um, you know you, you almost get better exposure if you've come from pit lane from a from a televisual point of view or from a commentary point of view or from a, a, a worldwide press point of view. If you've come out of pit lane and won the race from there, you're going to get double the accolades you would have done if you cleared off in the distance um, from the flag from the uh, lights out. So I think that. Teams need to look a bit more inwardly. I think that the teams need penalising more than um, more than the riders. I think the riders have had their penalties and it hasn't had any real effect, has it? They've sort of got over it and they're just prepared to take those penalties. Yeah, well, I think uh, it's difficult to disagree with you. Let's talk Moto3 race action now. Pete, let's bring you on this. It was Dennis Foggia winning ahead of Garcia and Fanati. How have you made the Moto3 action up until uh, this point in the season? Foggia under pressure throughout, but able to respond well. Yeah, he's really on form, isn't he? Now, you know, um, of course, the big big news coming into the race was uh, was Acosta's injury, if you like, in in qualifying, which which links in a bit with what we're saying there about the whole qualifying system, because it was a this messy accident coming onto the main straight, and I think some of the riders had even taken the checkered flag. So, but it was all caused by people leaving at the same time from the pits, you know, and this is this is this all links into causing these dangerous situations that, that Keith mentioned. So, anyway, luckily. 
having been declared unfit for qualifying, he was back for the race. So that was great news for him. And, and you know, he did a great job in, in salvaging decent points and he's got a great big lead. But yeah, Foggia is really, you know, he, he's, uh, he's hitting form now. And, and if he can carry this on, he's got a big task ahead to catch Acosta, but um, he's the man of the moment. My favourite um, big hit of the weekend was Fanati again. Him and his teammate having a bundle in pit in their pit box. <laughs> I tell you what, I know I shouldn't, and I know I'm going to get trolled for this, but I love Fanati. <laughs> He's so spiky, honestly. I don't know what happened in the pit box. Nobody does, but they both got penalties, so obviously they were both equally. Um, but uh, obviously Fernandez, his teammate, got up his nose, and Fanati uh, is not a kid that you really got to, you know. You, 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 if his IR is up, you're going to cop one, that's for sure. So Fanati finishing on the podium after having a punch up and a penalty. He got two laps, two long lap penalties, and still finished third on the podium, which kind of underlines yeah. what we're saying. I was going to say, do you call that impressive, um, or do you go, there's that a the reason problem? Why you got your two long laps? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it is. Uh... It is, um, uh, what was most of three, Acosta who leads with 158 points to Sergio Garcia, 110. That's a 48-point gap between uh, first and second. So it's going to be a lot to overcome. John McPhee going into the summer break with a solid result in sixth there. That takes some, some heart from that going into the summer break where he can hopefully sort of get, get a run on things into the second half. Keith, you're already shaking your head. What have I said? Well, no, it's not what you said. I just feel yeah. for John. I mean, some of it's been his fault. Some of it hasn't been his fault. But we're in round nine and he, he's only scored in four rounds. You know, that's that's the, the bottom line of it. You don't win world championships when you don't score points in five of the nine races you've been in, for whatever reason. Um, it's a very frustrating time for John. And difficult to see what's going to happen to him at the end of the year with the way it is. He's going to have to start winning some races. You know, he's he's in a very, very difficult... He'll know it better than anybody. He won't need any, any of us to, to remind him of it, but we are anyway. But um, 13th place in the championship, 37 points compared with the 158, like you've said, of Acosta at the top. You know, that's uh, irretrievable. All he can do now is, is go. And again, we are going to have a short second half of the year. I feel fairly sure of that. We've got Texas that's now on. Um, that's coming to join us after Japan has dropped out. Um, but Thailand is still tight, as in COVID-wise. I mean, they're getting jabbed over there now. Um, I'm reliably informed. Australia, Sydney's just been shut down for another two weeks as of today. Um, I can see the Australian round going again. Now in the state of Victoria, it's like a nanny state down there anyway, so you can be fairly sure that they're not going to let us oiks in. Um I'm fairly sure that that's going to be shut down. Malaysia, maybe, because it's Patronus and Sepang International, maybe maybe they'll find a way around that there because you can do those kind of things in that situation. I don't know. I, ju I just think that we're going to be two, at least a couple of rounds shorter than we've, we've scheduled this year. Um, unless they go for a double at, at Texas, you know, they could do that, I suppose, keep them out in America for an extra one to, to make that work. Um, Silverson. Looking forward to Silverstone. Don't quite know what form it will be in, but um, I'm looking forward to it. Nonetheless, it's going to feel like a breath of fresh air if we can get mm. down there. Well, yeah. But no, it's a, it's a tricky one. McPhee, having said that, that sixth place that he got at the weekend uh, bumped him up three places. He was 16th in the championship. He's now 13th in the championship. So, yes, it is positive. So, therefore, let's stick with the positive for him yeah. for a minute. For me, anyway. And uh, just coming back on that, actually, so for Pete, for cutting... Um, you out there you go please you've got more important things to say than i have no i was just going to say and on the other side of the garage of course you know the team they never seem to have just a clean yeah. race for both riders do they i mean we saw three place penalty for, for darren binder who speaking about next year it sounds like he has a chance of going up to motor two next year so um you know there's a lot going on there but clearly he was Fuming. I think he said he said something something with begin with F, didn't he? After the race, fiddlesticks. Something that begins with an F and one that ends fiddlesticks. with an F. Um, actually, <laughs> Pete, it's like you're reading my mind because we've had a question in from Tiva, which is what I wanted to go on to. Why did Darren Binder have a have to drop three places instead of one? Simple question there from Tiva, but is there a simple answer? <laughs> Why they didn't make their mind up in the first place was a funny bit. First of all, he got one, one, drop one place, and then the, the thing went across the bottom of the screen, two places. And then it went across the bottom of the screen, three places. And you could see Binder slowly but surely, oh, yeah. it was rising. He was getting redder and redder. 
and then he let a load of Fs go. So, well, so is there an answer to that question? Uh, yeah, I, th- I think so. So he he exceeded track limits. I think it was twice. Certainly more than once. I think it was twice. But as you could see from his reaction, the second one was was very hard to see visually, shall we put it? But as Keith explained, there's there's sensors in the curbs, so that's why these things can be triggered when it, even when it looks like they haven't done anything. But it, it's the problem that we keep coming back with with penalties is no one likes races or position changes after the checkered flag. I mean, they're bad enough during the race, but when you get people changing position afterwards. But well, it, on the last lap, we've seen this, this is what happens, and it's it's the latest example of track limits on the last lap. Well, it can get worse than that. You can finish your race, you know, having been penalised already by going off at turn 12 at Saxon Ring, and then find that you've got a penalty going into this round at Aston, a la Jake Dixon. You know, what was all that about? I mean, from where I'm stood and all the cameras I see, that just looked to me like a... 50-50 racing incident. We're all coming, we're arriving at turn 12, which is a tricky old corner anyway, dropping down the hill from Saxon Ring. But, you know, he was already, Dixon was already penalised by the fact he'd gone across the gravel. He finished, you know, he was a stone last when he re, rejoined the race. So then they give him another penalty coming into this one, which wrecks the Patronus team's, you know, momentum going into Assen, which which I know Dixon would have been really looking forward to because he's a track he knows. Um, don't know. Freddie, we're ready for you. If we can get <laughs> we re- you next week, we, we really will. are. Okay, last one on, on Moto3 before we move up to Moto2 then. So it, is it Acosta's to lose now? We are into the summer break. Acosta seems like he can pretty much get a solid result no matter what's thrown at him. Keith, let's come to you. And then Pete, who's going to win this championship? Well, Acosta at the moment, I mean, he's he's been brilliant, hasn't he? Anyway, I mean, his track craft has been brilliant. Um, he's had the wins. He's, the way he's, it's not just that he's had the wins, it's the way he's won quite mm. often, the way he's come through towards the end of a race. But, to, I mean, that picture of him in the hospital bed the night before, eating a burger. <laughs> <laughs> he's my man, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> he, he might be only 16 or whatever he is now. He's 16 still, I think. And he's there. He's had the biggest clattering. I mean, he's, he's had a bike run him over, run over his chest. Ooh. He's had to go to hospital, miss missed the bloody session that he was looking forward to anyway and then um, they've kept him in overnight and i can't remember which journo said it now it might have been hodgie actually on um, on bt sport and said something along the lines of yeah they don't keep you in hospital just for the just for the bed space you know you're not you're, you're there for a, a very distinct reason like observation is not because they like the look of you it's because they're worried about you so the fact that he was in hospital under observation and they let him out to race and he finished fourth, which was magnificent. But I still think that picture of him with all the, the electronic devices on him and the burger in his hand, brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a cost us to lose. I mean, it, everything Keith, Keith has said. For me also, it's it's not just the races that, that he's won that have been impressive. It's when he hasn't been on race winning form, you know, that he's able to keep his head, not overdo it, which is seems to be a rookie thing quite often that, you know, they get that panic on of why aren't I going as quick as the other guys and then they fall off. He's been able to keep that under control and, you know, it's hard to see him throwing it away now, let's, let's be honest. I think it's uh, it's very difficult, isn't it, to disagree with that. OK, let's move on then to Moto2 at the end of all that. Ralph Fernandez wins ahead of Remy Gardner and Augusto Fernandez. Fan- Fernandez really had to sort of fight hard for that victory. Uh, brilliant move on, uh, on Sam Lowe's and, and the other Fernandez as well just sort of really showing considering his uh, his experience compared to his teammate of Gardner he's very precise with that bike isn't he and it's sort of showing more and more what he's capable of and a great bounce back after sort of uh, crashing out last weekend as well I think it showed us two things it showed us how good he is but we already knew that um, and what a good year that Aki Ayo's team's having but it also for me showed how mature Remy Gardner was he wasn't going to push it just that you know Remy Gardner of old would have slung it at the fence rather than seeing his teammate be in front of him is my opinion but Remy Gardner this time just had to give best this week um he won't be next time that's for sure but uh, with a 31 point lead Gardner has over Fernandez the IO team well I don't know what the phrase is they're having it off at the moment aren't they it's looking really really good exactly it was just a, a further sign of why even though Fernandez keeps saying I'm saying I'm 99% Moto2 was his words wasn't it People are linking, well, I, linking. I had ninety with... written down. Oh, did, oh, okay. Well, maybe it changes, you know, depending on the on the session. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you could see why. I mean, if he carries on at this rate, you would almost say 
I mean, he's won what three three races now, I think. If he keeps on going like this, why why spend another year in in Moto Two, even if he doesn't win the title? Um, but wait, well, I mean, Io will have two guys going up to Moto GP, and with um, with the Yamahas, as we've already covered right at the very beginning of this this uh, lengthy chat, three hours ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, Fernandez, he's going to be on everybody's shopping list, isn't he? Remy Gardner's going up to Moto GP next year. Um, and that just goes to show you the strength. And I talked about rider managers. They don't come any better than Aki Ayo. He might own that team, but um, he's also a rider manager as well, manages some good names. And uh, he's going to be manoeuvring for his, for his boys as well. He's going to make sure that they get the best deal. Well, Peter Warner has asked, with the current rumours of impressive riders such as Acosta and Fernandez being swiftly moved up classes, do you believe it's actually their best option or do you think they would benefit from a second year in their respective classes? Look, I mean, it's a, it, it's a question for the rider and for his personal manager. He will know where his head's at with all of this, as it is at the moment. I mean, I think that if the manager has got a deal on the table with a good team with a top line motorcycle, go for it, would be my, my view. Again, if it's Aprilia or actually they're all, the trouble is they're all very, very good teams now. But second riders of Aprilia have notoriously not done well. Um, and that's the, the, only, the only thing I would say. A manager that gets a second rider in an Aprilia, Aprilia or any of the other teams. If you're a second rider, you genuinely are a second rider. You're second in their thoughts. They are second in their pay. Um, in quite often the cases, you're paying to be as a second rider. Uh, it's gone down the old car route a little bit on that one. Um, there are a few pay rides still in the paddock. But um, if I was Raul Fernandez's uh, management, the only way that I would have him going up to MotoGP is if it was with a top team both motorcycle-wise and in their management. Uh, that's the way that I would be doing it. Keith, if you were Raul Fernandez, as you say, or, or his manager, would you be slightly concerned that, that the factory KTM guys look like they're going to be locked in there for another couple of years? You know, is, is that maybe the one trump card that Yamaha have is we've got an open seat at the factory team? You know, that's the one thing that KTM maybe yeah. can't... You've got a lot of teammates in KTM, haven't you? A lot of good teammates in KTM that could just, if you have a slight dip in your performance, someone can s slide in there really quickly. And we saw how ruthless they were with um, the Frenchman. Uh, when Zarco quite politely said, look, at the end of the year, it's not working for me, so um, I think I'll try and get out of this if I can at the end of the year. And the effective was from the Austrians, well, why wait till the end of the year? Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of... Um, it's quite again it comes back down to the fact it's business and it's ruthless and it's it's hard and it's and it's gritty and you've got to get on with it i i would say that rail fernandez if given the right ride should go um and i think that's just one more reason peter that you've just put up there as to why you should go is that take your opportunity if it's the right opportunity at the time but conversely he's, he's going to be looking across and he's going to be thinking yeah maverick vinales did that stepped away from Suzuki and went to Yamaha, which looked like the best deal in the world at the time. And um, it didn't work out for him. Suzuki, again, from a team perspective, seems to be a, a calmer team, a more gentle team. Although having lost Brivio, it might not be now. Things might have changed at Suzuki. These things are fluid, aren't they? Every year, you know, stuff changes. Um, but yes, <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> I would move. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but it, well, it, it is Remy Gardner. I feel like talking. <laughs> it is Remy Gardner with a 31-point lead uh, from Fernandez. Uh, Bezzecchi third. Sam Lowe is also cementing fourth with a, a good return to form from him as well. He's going to be... What, what's next for Sam Lowe's? I know we've spoken about it kind of on and off a little bit, but if we just sort of focus lastly on Lowe's here in the Moto T uh, chat, what, what does Lowe's need to do to try and, you know, get, get a Moto GP ride for next year? Is that feasible? Is it on the cards? Not on the cards as far as I'm aware at the moment. I mean, as I said earlier, Roger Burnett, his team manager, will be working quite hard to, to, to look at what there is available um, to see whether there's a position for him. But what he needs to be doing is winning races again. Um, fifth the round before, fourth last time out, good ride. Um, needs to keep it on the track, really, Sam, and keep it working. Those two wins back in uh, Qatar are seeming like a long way off. 
Um, and when you're in uh, the summer break at the moment, and the fact that he's had a couple of reasonable rides leading into the summer break always helps your negotiations. You know, summer break is a is a, a busy time from a managerial point of view. And with what's happening at Yamaha, that's just been ramped up to sort of boiling point now. Um, you know, Sam and Roger will be eyeing up what the possibilities are. But when you've got so much talent that's lined up at the minute of a certain age as well, you know, Sam's in a in an e equally difficult position. You know, he's a, he's a super talent on a Moto2 bike. He can ride a MotoGP bike. We know that. Um, it's whether somebody is going to take that, that I'll use the word risk, because there's always an element of risk in it. We'll see. As you're saying, Keith, the, the trouble is there's so few rides up up for grabs this year, as we've, as we've been saying with Vinales' situation. You know, where's he going to go? You know, and he's a, a nine-time MotoGP race winner, and he's got limited options. So Sam's best chance really is is next year. There's a there's a lot of contracts at the end of next year coming up for grabs. Dorna have shown that if you win the Moto2 title, they will help you get a MotoGP seat, won't they? So I think if that that's Sam's best chance really. I think. He's got to focus now on, on building up and, and, and focusing on next year, getting the title, and then that's his best route, in my opinion, back to MotoGP. Dorna are desperate for a Brit to be in MotoGP competitively. Well, we'll see how it all plays out. Final one then on Moto2. It's, is it Gardeners to win and well, Gardeners to lose as well in uh, Moto2? It's hard to see anyone coming back. I hate saying, you know, oh, it's, I want it to be unpredictable, but he's got, you know, he's just got it all going for him, hasn't he? Well, once you take the competitive side of it out of it, then you have to look at the injury side of it. And that's the one wild card that you can never get away from at this level of sport. You know, Remy is looking smoother than he's ever looked. He's looking like a proper weapon. He's faster than everyone else, pretty much, most of the time. So it's really just down to staying fit. It only takes one mistake. Yeah, I think he's certainly in a... If you look at Moto3, there's a much bigger risk of just losing a lot of points in a race, gaining a lot of points. You know, as, as we've been saying, Moto2, it's Akiyah's team. They're at the top every week, week in, week out. And especially when it's your teammate that's your title rival, it's harder for them to gain points on you because, you know, maybe a team has a bad race. Well, that means maybe Remy has a bad race, but also his teammate will. So you, you move up and down together, if you see what I mean. It's, it's harder to make those big gains. And, um, you know, Remy's looking rock solid at the moment. It's going to be interesting, though, I think, to see as Fernandez builds, you, you know, this this kind of the, the situation between them. I think it'll be I think it could be quite fascinating, but undoubtedly Remy, Remy is the favourite. Absolutely. Again, no one to disagree with. Right. Finally, predictions. Now, no race predictions, obviously, because we've now got a bit of a gap. But and again, it, I suppose it brings up the whole well, if the competitive edge is gone, then maybe it's the injury side of it. But I want your MotoGP world title predictions, please, locked in now. And you cannot change them uh, no matter what happens in the second half of the season. Well, we're, we're, and go on. All of us are going to go for Quattararo, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I'm not. Well, if you. Because I, I, you know, I'm an, I'm a newbie. This is my rookie year in MotoGP and motorcycling. So I'm going to go outside the box here because I still think all to play for. And who knows? And perhaps this might be naivety coming through, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go first, and I'm gonna go with Zarco. Brave move, and I like someone that has a sporting bet. That's usually me that goes for the sporting <laughs> yeah. bet. Yeah. <laughs> but you, and you are, if you both want to go for Quartararo, I will allow it. I, I think what we should do, Harry, if I may, I mean, I don't want oh, to please. spoil your game, but um, no, maybe we I'm ought to go. Since we're going this far in advance, maybe we ought to go for a top three. Oh, okay. That seems more sensible, actually. Yes. Okay. So you're one, two, three. Go In on, which Pete. case, Pete can have uh, the right. honour of going first. Uh, I will go Quattararo, one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, two, two. Yeah, Zarco. I think Zarco, yeah. He could he could hold second and I'll go Banyaya third. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, what you mean sense. exactly as they are at the moment? Exactly as it is now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can read a bit further down the list if you like. Pete. <laughs> oh. I get where you're coming from. Wait, can you just repeat that for me? So that is the top three as they currently stand going into the summer break: Quartararo, uh, Zarco, yeah. and Bagnaia. Okay, they're locked in from Pete. <laughs> Keith, uh, you can go next. 
I top reckon. Three, please. Seems we've got two Austrian rounds. Fast old Silverstone. I'm going to go. Well, Quattararo, I think, will win it. 34 point lead at the moment. It's going to take. It's going to take an injury to mess that up. I'm going to go Quattararo. Bagnaia. And Mia. Oh. Fair Just enough. to be a bit different. I think okay. Suzuki's going to come back a little bit stronger after the break. I think Bang has shown real good form, but been a bit unlucky so far. I, I, I actually should go Quattarara, Bang Yaya, Zarco, but um, I, again, it's that sporting bet that I can't get away from. Oh. And the world champion, I don't think we've seen the best of him yet this year. Fair enough. I feel like I'm now being a bit of an but, idiot. But the only trouble is, I, I kind of talked myself into, into something and then out of it, because... Like, really, with the two Styrian rounds, we've got two in Austria, which is going to be Ducati and KTM that are going to be flying. Um, and you've got Silverstone, which is, you know... Well, actually, Suzuki and Yamaha at Silverstone have got quite... So has Honda got quite good form. Aragon, again. <laughs> I'll stick with what I said. OK, well, I'm going to go... I'm going to stick with my Zarco. Um, who knows? An injury, potentially. And then Quartararo second. And I'm going to put Oliveira is going to work his way up to third, I think. Yeah, um, that's a good shout. I like yeah, that. Yeah. I think Oliveira definitely should be on there somewhere. So yeah. I think we've got a good mix there. So one of we us have. is definitely going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are locked in now. So we uh, we cannot change that. So just to confirm, Pete has gone for Quartararo, Zarco and Bang Naya, the top three come the end of the year. Keith is Quartararo for champion, Magnaia second, and Mir in third. And I've gone Zarco champion, Quartararo second, and Oliveira third. So uh, we will come back to that whenever the season ends. <laughs> and and if you want to get involved, I think you should, you, you should throw it out there, Harry, and find out what other well, people the top think. Three. Yeah, go on then. Well, if you want to get involved and also be a part of our locked-in uh, predictions, send us a tweet, an Instagram, whatever works best for you. Just find us on uh, Crash Moto GP. Send that in. We'll collate them and uh, we'll uh, maybe we'll make a little leaderboard come the end of the year as well and, and see who gets closest to it. Um, but I'm now feeling a bit stupid for putting Zarko first. But hey, I'm going to stick with it to the very end. Um, once again, though, gents, I think that just about does it after all of that. Thank you for your thoughts and input uh, as ever. And a big thanks to you all uh, and for our listeners and watchers. We really appreciate you commenting, leaving reviews and and sending your questions in do send in your title predictions please your one two and three locked in you cannot change them until well next year now uh, we are entering the summer break though it's a five week gap now till austria but never fear we will still be here every week because there is still lots to discuss and we'll be keeping you uh, up to date with any breaking news throughout the summer in the next few shows we'll be talking everything you could imagine stewarding safety track limits rider moves i want to talk about electrification in motorbikes i'm going to bring some moto e-chat in for you too whether you like it or not uh, and a lot more and as ever if you've got any questions then yeah get them into our socials and keep up to date with all the very latest moto gp news at crash.net and join us next time for more moto gp talk we'll see you then <laughs>